This is the first panel of the day. It's Harnessing Innovation and Disruption, the Future of Financial Services. This session is going to be chaired by Jerry Cross, the Director of Financial Regulation, Policy and Risk at the Central Bank. And I'd like to invite the panellists to the stage now and allow me to introduce them as they, as they come forward. We will have uh, Francois-Louis Michaud, uh, Executive Director with the European Banking Authority with us today. Ruth McCarthy, uh, Chair of Fintech and Payments Association of Ireland and Managing Director of FEXCO Corporate uh, Payments. Theodore uh, Cockle Corin, Chair of the Central Bank of Ireland's uh, Consumer Advisory Group. Colm Lyons, uh, CEO with Fire Financial Services. And Laurie Kyo, uh, Co-Founder of Blockchain in Ireland and Head of EMA, EA Market Operations. Uh, welcome everyone and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for that welcome and good morning uh, everybody. Um, well, we have a, a hard act to follow, um, but uh, I think we are, we are well equipped uh, to do that because we've got a very exciting topic. Um, harnessing disruption, driving financial services to reach their potential for innovation. Um, in setting the agenda for this conference, we were very much um, sort of wanted to have at the heart of it, and we were very much looking forward to having discussion around innovation uh, and technological development. And I sort of feel I've been very uh, fortunate to be able to, to chair this session. Um, so I had, had a hand in the setting of the agenda, so, so that was kind of my, uh, my, my good luck to be able to, to, to do this. I'm particularly looking forward uh, to the conversation with our panel of guests on what I think is really uh, exciting, fascinating and timely topic. And I think it, it follows on really <coughs> very naturally from some of the issues that were uh, discussed uh, by Commissioner uh, McGuinness um, and the Deputy Governors uh, just now. <coughs> um, Simon Sinek tells us that innovation is hard. Uh, it's experimentation, it's trial and error, and it demands determination for success. And I imagine that all of our panelists will attest to that in, in one way or another. However, a well-functioning financial services market depends on successful innovation. Uh, the ideas, the developments, the efficiencies that new entrants and incumbents can bring, along with the impact of their innovation and disruption on others, are key drivers uh, of effective market functioning. From the Irish perspective, Ireland is home to a great deal of technological innovation, with very active Irish-based innovators and indigenous firms, while also being chosen as a base jurisdiction for many expanding technology-driven firms who plan to serve the wider EU market from an Irish base. Uh, from the bank's perspective, uh, technological innovation is a very important focus of our attention, uh, and you'd have heard it discussed over the last uh, day and a half how at, in, in our uh, multi-year strategy, uh, future focus and innovation is very much at the heart of that. Uh, we recognise not only that rapidly evolving technological innovation is a key feature uh, of the financial services environment, but that it brings very significant potential benefits. In his recent book, uh, Azim Azhar uh, speaks to the rapid increase in the scale and ever faster pace of innovation, noting that it follows a curved and exponential line. And he highlights a challenge, and Commissioner McGuinness referred to this in her opening remarks, that our institutions, political, economic and regulatory, change more slowly. And this presents questions and challenges for all of us, not least as for us as policymakers and regulators. Now, as I mentioned, the core theme of the bank's strategy is being future focused to enable the bank to understand, anticipate and harness this environment of rapid change and innovation. Many of you here today may be aware of the Central Bank's Innovation Hub, which we set up in 2018, uh, which was set up for two reasons. One, uh, to facilitate engagement and provide a direct point of contact for t technology-led firms, as well as more traditional providers looking to engage with regulators uh, in, a, in, a, in a slightly less formal, slightly more uh, um, innovative way uh, on, on issues related to technological, uh, technological development. And secondly, and this has been very valuable as well, to provide the bank with early intelligence, and again, this was referred to in, in, in the previous discussion, to early intelligence on where innovation is going, and especially where those innovations are taking place outside the regulatory <coughs> perimeter, but are likely to uh, impact and perhaps come inside that perimeter over time. 
Our, our hub has provided a valuable mechanism for engagement uh, between ourselves as regulators and those involved uh, in innovation on the ground. Um, and we see earlier engagement by firms with the Innovation Hub as assisting the smooth and timely operation of the authorization process. But I will say, and we've touched on this, and we also think that, um, as has been discussed, things are moving fast and we do want to look at how the hub is operating to see how it can be improved. In short, the bank wants to help secure the benefits of change, innovation and competition for consumers, investors and the economy as a whole, while ensuring that the risks are well managed. And for our, from our perspective, I think success uh, is, has two aspects. First of all, that we will have played our role in fostering an innovative and resilient financial sector, which serves the evolving needs of Irish and European households and businesses into the future. And two, that we will have developed the necessary capabilities, <coughs> analysis, risk assessment and oversight uh, to enable robust supervision for the protection of consumers and the financial system. So, this morning I'm delighted to welcome a panel of speakers with a deep and rich array of experience, expertise and insights into these issues. The question we'll be discussing is how to best harness disruption to drive financial services to reach the potential of innovation. I very much hope that this will be an interactive session and look forward to questions and comments from you, the audience, both in the room uh, physically and in the room virtually. So with that said, let me say a, war a warm welcome to our panellists who are from my far left. First of all, Colm Lyon, CEO of Fire Financial Services. Colm is also member of the Payments Standards Strategy Group of UK Finance and member of the International Advisory Board of UCD Innovation Academy. Next to Colm uh, is Ruth McCarthy. Uh, Ruth is the CEO of Fexco Corporate Payments uh, and Ruth is also chair of the FinTech and Payments Association of Ireland. Uh, welcome to you, Ruth. Uh, in the middle here, uh, Francois-Louis Michaud. Francois-Louis is Executive Director at the European Banking Authority. Uh, the EBA has been very active in the field of regulation and innovation, going back quite a, a significant period of time now. Uh, Francois-Louis was uh, previously Deputy Director General within the Single Supervisory Mechanism at the ECB, and prior to that he was a Director Adjoint at the SCPR uh, in France. Uh, to, to Francois Louis's right is Laurie Kyo. Uh, Laurie is head of EMEA operations at Coinbase, and Laurie is also founder and advisory board member of Blockchain Ireland. And of course, last but not least, to my immediate left, Theodore Cockelcoran. Uh, Theodore is, amongst other things, former board member of the Dutch Authority for Financial Markets, the AFM. He's currently Inspector of General of Mind in the Netherlands and Associate Professor at the TS School for Business and so Society. And very importantly, uh, Theo is Chair of the Central Bank's Consumer Advisory Group. So welcome uh, to you all. Uh, thank you for, for being with us. So let me jump to the first question. And Theo, if I may, I'll start, start with you. Um, and let's start from the heart of the matter, which is, as is on the, on the theme of the conference, delivering for consumers. From your perspective, Theo, how do you think about the implications and impact, good and bad, for consumers uh, of our increasingly technology-focused and technology-driven financial sector? Uh, how, what's your thinking around that? <clears throat> yeah, so th thank you very much also for the, the invitation for, for, for being here. It's, it's a great honor and, and, and certainly for the theme of this, of this conference. I think I think we have to be um, uh, quite realistic that um, the impact of technological change on on the financial system and certainly on on consumers is typically not as straightforward as uh, you know many decades ago the advent has been of of the automated uh, uh, teller machine where actually it was a w very straightforward impact uh, a big win for everyone perhaps except for uh, the teller clerk. Uh, much often, uh, uh, financial innovation has a much more mixed, and I, th I would also say complicated impact uh, on, uh, on society. Uh, we've seen, uh, for example, with the credit derivatives, which is a very useful uh, innovation, which has improved and elevated risk management, but it was taken to extremes, and we have seen in the, in the financial crisis to what impact those extremes uh, uh, can lead. Um, and now we are seeing uh, a third generation of the internet coming up. We are seeing AI, we are seeing crypto. They will certainly bring good uh, to our society, but they also have the potential to actually also bring harm 
uh, for many and, uh, and, 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 and benefit for, for some. So it's, it's, it, these are complicated uh, things and I, I think it's inevitable um, that you, we need uh, effective uh, regulation and effective uh, regulators to actually um, guide these, these developments. And I think there's one point I really would like to, to highlight, um, which is that uh, we tend to think that this, this innovation, this technological innovation, may actually help in also simplifying uh, products, financial products and financial services, so that the reach of the innovation is actually very large. But I think we should be realistic there as well and realize that uh, typically uh, financial innovation not necessarily makes products uh, more simple. And the, the divide within our society of those who are able uh, to jump on the new developments and are able to work with it versus those who may have uh, their smartphone and may be tapping their fingers on the screens and, and swiping but not fully understanding actually what they are doing or fully understanding what they could be doing, I think this is a, this is a critical thing to, uh, to watch. Uh, because the implication is, uh, we, we are making assumptions. We are, we are making the assumption that um, people eventually catch up. We will make the assumption that, well, people will adapt to the, the products and the services that are as a drive from innovation, that they will adapt to that. But I think uh, that is not uh, for all of us uh, the case. There are sizable groups in our society who are not able to adapt. And you know, all these new uh, uh, products and services, they're being developed by these new flashy uh, organizations. And, and, and again, they, they, are, they are bringing goods, but they're also sometimes perhaps with, with our technical minds in the technical cloud and not always looking for these particular groups uh, 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 of people. And as a result, um, these people increasingly may tend to feel disenfranchised. And, and actually that's a, a slow but steady increasing uh, corrosion in, in our societies. And, and one last point on this. We, we I think, and it's, it's been already discussed a number of times, uh, I think financial education is critical and also trying to educate people for digital abilities is also critical. But it's, uh, it's a necessary thing to do, but it can never, never be a sufficient thing to do. Because you cannot educate away the gap that there exists between some of these groups uh, and the new uh, technological products and services that are becoming offered. So, and especially in the regions uh, where increasingly the tellers are disappearing, uh, people are left with as the only choice, an app, which they may not really be able to, uh, to handle. So I think financial inclusion is as urgent as the speed of which the new technological developments are, are moving. And I think it's something that, that governments uh, should, should take action on <coughs> really uh, uh, intensely. Well, th thanks, Yolanda. That's a very stimulating uh, first um, contribution. So. Um, I think you're, you're bringing your attention very clearly there to that, that question, which has been actually very live in, in, in the Irish uh, context recently, which is that, that, that issue around the, the potential for people to be, as I understand you saying, materially left behind, not just sort of transitionally, but that there's a big, uh, big question for us to think about. Okay, th thank you for that. Maybe I'll turn, uh, Laurie, if I may, to you. So what, 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 what are your thoughts? Is it a a very positive picture that we're, we're looking at in terms of innovation and where it can take us in terms of consumer benefits? Um, I, I think building on some of the points that were made there, the, one of the key things um, that has struck me and continues to strike me is, is speed, right? Is the speed of innovation. Um, that, that's a key factor. I think if we look at uh, speed, ease of access or the ability to access new financial assets and instruments. Um, and then also, um, I guess the ease of use um, to, to onboard and start using these things has become, uh, that is a really big factor. What are the things that are driving that? I think if we look at, um, I guess, open source technology is a huge driver of that. And specifically, if we look at the, the crypto and blockchain industry, nearly all the blockchains that are created are open source. 
which enables basically you, Jerry, to come along and go, I like the blockchain that you've created, Laurie, but I'm going to change the color, so to speak. I'm going to change this. And then someone else will come along and say, I like the one Jerry's created. And then they'll create your own version. And this is creating so many new products, new applications, new features. And it's a real driver, which feeds into that speed uh, component. I think also what we have is cloud, which is a really important development. Um, we've seen over the last, I guess, 10 years, and it still has a lot, a lot of way to go um, in terms of uh, adoption, where people are able to, I guess, dial up and down the usage um, that they have around it. Um, and then as we start to embrace more around, I guess, low code or no code solutions, all this is resulting in is a compression of the product development lifecycle, which means we're getting more products faster as we move through these phases faster. Like if we think about it, we go back 20 years, really what we're seeing, what the research has shown, if you go back 20 years, it cost about 5 million to create a product um, and a company associated with that. Flash forward five years, it went from 5 million to 500. Flash forward again, another five years, it went from 500,000 to about 50,000, when actually now you can develop a crude product with 5,000 or less. So speed is a big driver as to the impact that we're, we're seeing, feeling, and experiencing from a financial services technology perspective. And let me ask you then, is, that's a really powerful description of, of, of sort of the, the dynamic. Taking the consumer perspective, one of the arguments that we will hear, of course, is, well, the more that that is happening, yeah, the, the more that's kind of fomenting innovation and change and development. Um, do, do, do you perceive that as being, okay, that's fundamentally good, it's a fundamentally good place to be, and then we, we manage around the edges, but that's what we want to support. Or are you saying, maybe it's too fast? I think what happens with, with technology is that um, as new, new products and, uh, I guess, new products and services come about, consumers either adopt them or they don't, and the ones that, I guess, don't resonate with consumers fall away. Um, now, from a, a protection perspective, this is the challenge that I think the central bank and regulators around the world have, is that technology is moving so incredibly fast that regulators are always going to find it challenging to keep up with what's going on. And that is, I think, the challenge that, that you face. And it, and it leads back, actually, to, to this conference, which is, which is fantastic to see. Like, thank you for having, I guess, a, a the crypto community and a crypto company here to discuss this. In, in years gone by, this wouldn't have been the case, when actually now the level of engagement, that, that is a big step forward to understanding what is going on in relation to decentralized finance, in relation to NFTs, in relation to these other areas. So I actually see this as a, as a positive development locally and at a European level, so that there is, kinda, there is that visibility as to, well, what is, what is next? What are the next suite of um, crypto products that are coming up? And then how can we better understand them so that we can protect consumers, as, and also as the commissioner said, but also not limiting the innovation associated to it. What is critical is that there's a thing called Web3, where Web1 was all about read-only, read-only in relation to, to the internet. Web2 was about basically, think of Facebook, you're reading, you're writing, you're commenting on photos, um, you're engaging with other people in relation to online activities. And Web3 is all about read, write, own, or read, write, connect. So actually it's about you being in control of your data um, and plugging in your wallets uh, to various sites where they're then potentially able to participate in decentralized finance uh, activities, such as you plug in your wallet and then it enables you to, to borrow or lend without going through uh, an intermediary. Um, and it's, it's really important that we get that balance right rather than shut down Web3, and then the next suite of big tech companies, again, are based out of Silicon Valley, instead of being based out of Dublin, or Amsterdam, or Paris, as the case may be. And I really want it to be the latter. Well, thanks, Gary. First of all, Louis, you wanted to come in there, uh, I could see yeah, you. Just maybe, yeah, just thank, thank <laughs> yeah, I was extremely inspired by what, what, just what you said. And uh, I heard yesterday was extremely uh, fruitful, and, uh, and the debate yesterday was extremely rich. I, I must say this morning, we did, that didn't disappoint this morning. I mean, the, the, what we've heard from the commissioner, from the deputy governors, was uh, also extremely uh, in, insightful. Now, I mean, you, you mentioned speed and, and the magnitude of those changes that we are seeing now at, 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 uh, in, in action. I think the, the one consequence of that, I'd say, is that for the first time, it brings together financial stability issues and consumer protection issues for a long time or forever since then in the past I mean those two things were 
not schizophrenic, but almost. I mean, they, they were not exactly uh, handled by the same groups of people. They were not discussed in the same fora. They were not really handled together. And I think that's the big value of the conference that you organized today at the Central Bank of Ireland, to bring those topics together. Because now they belong together. And I think we've been, after the great financial crisis, rebuilding the strengths of the, of the financial system, I think now we are changing the debate completely and we cannot stop at the strengths of the institutions, the entities that we need to supervise collectively. But we also need to, to tackle that from a consumer protection perspective uh, and all the topics around the literacy and, and so on and so forth. But that's a that's complete change of paradigm, I would, I would argue. No, it's very, very interesting to hear you say that, and, and, and I, I hadn't thought of it in, in specifically in terms of, of, of innovation, but you're right, when I think back, uh, again, Commissioner McGuinness mentioned Facebook and, and DM at the time, and again, that was, as soon as that white paper was <coughs> there, you could see that co coalescing of, on the one hand, okay, what does it mean for consumers, but immediately, what does it mean for financial production? So, so I think you're, you, for financial stability. So I think that, that's, that's really interesting. I don't know, um, Ruth or Colin, on this particular question of how you're sort of seeing overall, anything you want, want to add before we go to the question of regulation? You go. Uh, I, I get, yeah, I, I guess innovation, um, my sense is that innovation in financial services, and my background obviously is in payments. And so we work obviously in, in, in the, a regulated sector. Um, both here and in the UK, we're regulated in, in uh, both jurisdictions. <laughs> And we have um, our family office is a big investor in early stage fintech and payments companies as well, some of whom may fall into the net of regulation. And I think, it, for me, like a great source of innovation comes from the startup community, and it comes from new businesses that come to market. And I, I think, you know, in terms of setting the scene for me, I think in this country we've a really poor track record of that, and we don't have you know, a, a, a healthy indigenous startup regulated sector. When you look at the non-bank financial institutions that are regulated here, there's about 38 or 40. Most of those are Brexit related applications are in fact their FDI applications. And the number of indigenous firms smalls into a small good category. And within that group of four or five firms, I think there's only one that ever started as a real startup, the rest were spin outs. So we don't have an ecosystem here where we can actually create regulated, you know, indigenous startups in the fintech and payment sector. And I think that's, that's one of the areas of great uh, focus from the industry, I know, for many, many years. And it's one of the things that we're re very happy to be here today talking about because we think that there are things that could be done because we think that that is a great source. And, you know, Laurie said that we hope that these new companies come from Paris or Dublin or wherever, but that they, they can and they could be created. But there is a, a, a sense of deep understanding of what it takes to be a startup that's required and, and a sense of the application and proportionality that needs to be done in a completely different way if we are to create that sector. But I think it's very important that we acknowledge that innovation isn't just about I mean, the level of innovation with existing institutions in terms of the payments products is not great. You know, in terms of the applications that we use, they're not great. You know, so again, we, we rely on, I think, new entrants to come in. And through the natural course of businesses, existing firms then often acquire those businesses and, for, you know, and bring them in. And that's the normal and kind of consolidation happens. So I think not having a, 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 an early stage regulated you know, fintech and payment sector here in it, in, with indigenous firms hurts us from a, an overall perspective in terms of building innovation. Thanks, Colin. That's a, that's a slightly bleak picture. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm going to come back to you in the next round and ask you what's the role of regulation in, in, in yeah. sort of that, in your perspective. But Ruth, maybe I'll turn to you. Fine. Just yeah. on that topic of kind of innovation and opportunities for innovation, um, Fexco Group was founded 41 years ago, and the trigger for the foundation of our group was the liberalisation of the rules relating to money changing in Ireland. So the central bank changed the rules regarding money changing, permitting non-banks to provide bureau de change services. And I think Fexco was the first non-bank to receive a licence. Um, creating that tiny space, that opportunity, mm -hmm. um, is what led to so much innovation, so much new product development, our growth in areas of consumer services, um, what would be regarded as kind of ancillary banking and payment services. So it's very important when we think about innovation to make sure that um, while we're ensuring safety and good consumer protection, 
where we can, we are leaving the door open for new entrants and new opportunities. Okay, that's, that's really um, interesting. And, and good that we seem to get something right, <laughs> if it was 41 years <laughs> 41 ago. 41 years ago. <laughs> um, but so, but that, that takes us nicely into, I think, that question of, um, of regulation and its, and its role. Maybe Francois Louis, as, the, um, um, as one of the, the regulators, the former regulators on, on the stage, let me, let me turn to you first of all. And, and, and clearly, we've got a, a, from that first discussion, we've got a, a good picture of the a sort of the multifaceted context that we're dealing with. <coughs> let me ask you a simple question. Um, do you think um, are financial regulators getting it right, or are they just not getting it? <laughs> well, are you expecting me to answer? <laughs> <laughs> no, first, first of all, I think we have to. I mean, that, that's very clear. And I, also, I would also say that we are trying hard. So we are certainly trying hard and, and trying our best and, and making, doing our best to, to, to get it right. Are we completely uh, successful? I don't know. But I think we, there are many examples which tend to say, show that we are, we are trying to, to get it right. Let me, let me explain a little bit. I think we, even the, the, the European Banking Authority in itself was created a little bit for that purpose as a small organization close to the ground, interacting with its members in the member states, uh, and close to the ground, to the financial sector, etc., getting insights from, from the authorities, from the financial sector, and, and interacting uh, with the legislators uh, in, a, uh, in, in, a, uh, in an agile and, I would say, uh, adaptive manner. And I think that that's pretty much what we, what we are trying to do collectively. And of course, we are not the, the only ones in that, in that field. But uh, we, we, just to give you a few examples, um, in, in, the, in the years 2019, for instance, we've answered uh, a big um, request uh, from, the, from the Commission, um, not, uh, not as ourselves only, but also with ESMA and EIOPA, our sister authorities, about uh, innovation facilitators. We've also launched a, a European Forum for Innovation Facilitators, which is a non fantastic place for exchanging about new trends new initiatives uh, in, uh, in, in, the financial, in the financial sector. Now, it's also fair to say that it's always been a little bit of a trade-off uh, in financial regulation between stability and efficiency, right? And as we know, innovation can affect both sides. It can affect efficiency positively or negatively, but it can also affect stability uh, efficiently or, 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 I mean, positively or, or not so, so positively. I think we, in the past, we've seen waves of regulations and the regulations we've been probably, or we are at the, at the end of the uh, re-regulation wave after the, the, the great financial crisis. And I think the, the, the way it's been um, working so far is more like, you know, regulators are trying to uh, fix something, but then the, the market moves elsewhere and, and, and innovation flourishes elsewhere. And, and then it's a little bit of a race or a game between the, the innovators and, and the regulators to, 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 to find the, the, to put the, the balance right again. I think what we are observing now with the initiatives that the commissioner this morning and uh, others were, were mentioning is slightly different. Because for the first time, I think we are trying to handle collectively innovation and stability at the same time. If, if, if one looks at the digital finance strategy, for instance, that the Commission uh, started uh, in September 2020, which is now coming to, 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 to conclusions, if we look at the uh, AI Act, if we look at all those initiatives uh, around um, digital uh, ledgers, uh, I mean, they all have a mechanism for testing, for sandbox for allowing a space of freedom and liberty for, for the innovators. And I think it's completely new. I mean, this way of handling, of trying to develop a new generation of regulation that also, of course, that, that offers a frame for, for, for the new types of products and activities that we see uh, arising, but that at the same time allows them to, to develop and, and to find their place in the system. That's a completely new approach. And I think we, we benefit a lot uh, when, when doing that, of course, for, for, from what we learn uh, from the different experiences in the different member states. And we benefit a lot from, from, from initiatives like here in Ireland. I mean, all the, the testing, the sandboxes approach, and the, 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 the relatively open mind vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, innovation that we see uh, in different forms and, and formats and, and ways in, in different countries. So I think this is... Probably, uh, we, we are trying hard. I think we, we may not get it completely right, but I think we are, we are trying uh, really hard. Now, the one question I would ask is whether we, um, we do enough to also communicate about what we do. Mm 
Because I think we, we, we are listening a lot. We are trying to learn a lot from the experience uh, that, we, that we see in the, in the financial sector, or that we see in the, in the regulatory community, also in Basel. I used to be in Basel also in the past, and that they've, they've started a fantastic series of initiative to, to test also uh, themselves uh, some of those new uh, technologies from a central banking perspective. Uh, it's really impressive. Uh, and they do that for, for, I mean, with hubs in different parts of the world, uh, which is also a very new approach. I think, are we doing enough uh, also to get our messages across? Uh, I'm not so sure about that. And, and the commissioner was also referring to that this morning, saying uh, TikTok can be a fantastic uh, financial advisor. Uh, that's right, but should we also try to um, communicate, uh, maybe not on, on those exactly same uh, media, but at least in the same formats? I mean, how, how do we make sure that our warnings, our messages, uh, every, everything we try to help people understand the risks of the products they are using, um, I mean, is really uh, hitting the target. I mean, I'm not so sure we, we are doing enough of that. Again, I mean, uh, opportunities like this one today help, but are we reaching out to the public at large? Uh, probably not enough. So, very I mean, one of the things uh, resonates with me as you speak and as, as a regulator, um, I think one of the challenges we have, and, and I see it, like, like I say, you know, as, as in, around the table at uh, EBA, for example, is it's, it's, almost, it's, it's a little bit more natural for us to think about, and particularly after the financial crisis, to think about the risks and how to address them. And of course, I think one of the things that people will say to us around this table is, yes, but you've also got to focus on how to make the better things happen mm -hmm. to allow things to flourish. And I think from what you're saying, but my sense of eBay is that actually you are working very hard in that space to kind of to, to see the sort of the, the, that, that bit around allowing things to flourish, allowing things to come to fruition. Is, is, um, but that is a journey. Is that, is that, is that fair? That, that's absolutely fair. Again, the, this initiative, the, the, the European uh, Forum for Innovation Facilitators, all the workshops we do, the consultations, and by the way, I encourage all of you to, con to participate in those, in those consultations, which we do repeatedly on every single uh, piece of new regulation we are preparing, or any advice we also prepare for, for commission. We, we are trying to, to, go, uh, to go along those lines, uh, as you say. I think it's really important that we allow in innovation to find its place, its role, uh, and, and that we don't, again, um, decide in favor of stability and the resilience of entities first and foremost. I think we should have, the, it's a balancing act, I think the, the, the tone uh, that, that the Commission, that the co-legislators have given in recent years is that we should really be trying to uh, balance things, uh, which is not easy, but we, uh, and, and uh, again, allow innovation to, uh, to transform the, the financial sector. And we see this innovation, by the way, transforming the sector from the inside, but also from the outside, of course, huh? because the banks and the other financial intermediaries are also transforming themselves, you know, I mean, and they are also faced with a lot of uh, disruptive changes coming from their competitors, from new entrance, etc., etc. So we are trying to maintain this um, balance right and, and to, to be aware of those forces and to encourage also uh, the uh, incumbents uh, to, to themselves uh, adjust their business models so that they can uh, better respond to, to the needs of the, of the economy and, uh, and of the customers. Thank you. Um, Ruth, you, 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 in your earlier comments, you, you noted that 41 years ago, some good things happened in regulation. What's your perspective now? Are, are we getting it right as financial regulators? What should we do better? Well, I just want to return to something that Laurie mentioned, that you can develop a product for 5K. You can, on a technical side, on a technological side, you could develop a product for 5K. But if we look at the expectations, the regulatory expectations, uh, the consumer protection expectations, um, the expectations around resilience, for instance, um, you develop the product and then you need to go away and do a lot of analysis. Um, the anti-money laundering impacts this product will have, whether it will result in detriment to consumers, um, how am I going to ensure that this is resilient, that customers will cash out and efficient, efficiently if they need to do so. Um, that's where most of your cost occurs in financial services now. So, um, I can't say that we should scrap all of that because it's been designed for a reason, but it does mean there are very significant costs associated with entering into financial services today that are unavoidable, regardless of how nimble and technically confident you may be. Um, I think when regulators are engaging with industry, it's really key that they bear that in mind. 
Startups are very poorly resourced, generally focused wholeheartedly on technology. They typically don't have time to draft a really good response to a consultation. They may not even have time to read a consultation paper, but this is where the innovation is occurring. Um, even if they don't have the ability to bring that product forward and make it competitive in the regulated financial environment, there is a good chance that they will find a partner who will enable them to do so. So the approach of the central bank of actively monitoring the non-regulated sphere or pre-regulated businesses I think is absolutely critical to understand what's coming next. Um, and if we want to encourage innovation, we just need to be very mindful that the voices that tend to speak most loudly in consultations and at conferences like these are the voices of businesses that already have strong, um, say, regulatory capability. They already have strong balance sheets. They're capable of releasing people for a day to attend an event like this. So it's very important that industry and regulators actively reach out to perhaps not very well funded or pre-revenue businesses with great ideas just so that we can see what's coming on the horizon and we're supporting innovation that's going to benefit consumers. Thanks, and thanks for that. And I think that probably plays column into your, what the comments you made earlier around it being a sort of a, a fairly, uh, not a very rosy picture in terms of st indigenous startups in, in financial innovation. Yeah. Is, is regulation uh, at fault? Are regulators at fault? I, I think it's yes and no. <laughs> so, no, fairness okay. to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I don't think, like, I think um, people understand the, the role of the regulator a lot more now than maybe before. Um, and there's, uh, you know, expertise has been built up within the industry over the last 10 years in particular when uh, we've seen that happen. I'm talking about here in, in Ireland, but also in the UK. And as Jerry mentioned, I sit on the Payments and Product Services Board for UK Finance. And I'm also on the strategic participant group for the new payments architecture in the UK. And I'm on the payments expert panel for the, um, the joint regulatory oversight committee, which is the PSR and the FCA on the future of open banking. So I do a lot of work in the policy space. And I, I think the first thing that I'd say is that like the, the central bank and indeed all regulators should have a published engagement strategy. They should actually publish a document that says, this is how we engage with you. And in particular, with the startup community and the, the smaller firms. And that's something I think that should be written down on a piece of paper and you know, put up on your website for people to see, so that that way we can understand that. And that's, I think, something that the FinTech and Payments Association, I think, recommended about eight years ago, yeah. was, was, was you know, an idea that we would love to have taken forward with you at the time. I, I can tell you what I think should be in the engagement strategy, um, or some of the things I think should be within it. Um, I think the, the for as, as uh, my sense is that the central bank and the way in which it authorizes and supervises payment firms straddles across multiple directorates and, and moves as well, and moved recently. And what's interesting is that the, the move is done without any involvement or consultation with the industry. And, you know, and that's fair enough, you're an independent organisation, but I think what we would say is, can you at least acknowledge that the decisions that you make have an impact? And can you, at the conclusion of those decisions, again, publish what your impact analysis is? So now, as a small regulated payment institution, we've been asked by the central bank what our deposits are. So we don't do the profits because we're not a bank, like we're a payment institution. So there's, there's kind of silly little things which have crept into the system which really could, could have been avoided had we had a conversation up front about that. So I think your engagement and the consultation process, as Ruth said, that we run with the sector are really, really important. I have so many consultation processes that we participate in in the UK. I would have three or four open at the one time. Here I've got very, very few. When the Competition and Consumer Protection Commissioner did a consultation in relation to cinch payments recently, we got four lines of information, and we were asked to submit our opinion. Our opinion is we need some information. Like, we, we, we don't know what we're actually talking about because we do not have it. There's no meetings held. There's no engagement. There's no roundtable discussions. There's no workshops. There's no one-day hackathons to go through what the issues might be with the central bank, for example. Can we actually take, because as Ruth said, we don't have the time to fill up Word documents to, you know, to write back in a submission 
that might get lost somewhere anyway. And you can, this is a much, much more meaningful conversation than that. We think that there should be approach documents published by the regulator. But what is your approach to regulating a small startup? And we think that should be downloadable in a PDF so that I can see it. So I know exactly what your expectations are from me when I've got two people, four people, six people, 10 people, 30 people. Fires a business with 30 people to give you our perspective on it, right? So we're a relatively small company that is scaling. We think that the perimeter guidance is really unclear in Ireland right now. The perimeter guidance between what is an EMI and what is a PI. Even before um, Brexit, mm -hmm. within the European region, there was great inconsistencies between whether a firm was a mm -hmm. PI or an EMI. That, for a small startup, isn't really acceptable because we'd say to you as regulators, would you just make up your minds? <laughs> we don't, I don't care what I am. Well, that, that's going to get fixed with PSD3, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and it's been so largely like, fixed also now. Yeah. I think. We, we, yeah. No, but no. So we, we ended up being regulated as a mm. payment institution mm. in Ireland, but as an, e an EMI in the UK, and we do exactly the same thing, which means we've now got to have two different calculations for capital adequacies and so on and so forth. So two different kind of models that we need to run within the company, which is an unnecessary burden for me as a startup, right? So again, perimeter guidance in the area of platforms. When do you see platforms being regulated or not? How do you see marketplaces working? Tell us what you think, because we can't have every legal firm go and getting legal opinions about its business model, right? You have to be able to take 80% of the discussion away and then, you know, for the 20% that are more complex, fine, let them go off. But for the bog standard, you know, marketplaces, platforms, AISP, the account information service providers, the payment initiation service providers, and I think, you know, if I can say one of your biggest own goals might have been your decision with regard to Cinch and w where you went and you put up on your website that you were acting as a catalyst, you know, for the, the, bank, the banks to come together to make what we regard as a payment initiation service, which is currently unregulated, which is kind of a creates, it creates real confusion within the market because if I wanted to bring out a product, say, to compete with Cinch tomorrow, I would expect that in the license for me to do that, but yet they don't. And is that because the ownership? So where is your thinking on this, if you like, is what I... So what I think happens with all this kind of uncertainty, and it, as an investor within the sector, we hesitate. Mm. And that's what the real message is, that investment is stalled and investment will hesitate. And I think your role has to be to bring an element of clarity to the perimeter guidance, bring an element of clarity to the approach documents. And my long-term dream, will be to see the central bank create a payment services regulator within its directors, right? And that there will be a function dedicated within the, pay, you know, the central bank that the industry could engage with from an authorization, supervision, and all the expertise, because I think you have to build up expertise as well within the central bank in the area of payment processing. Because trying to, I'm just not convinced that putting the supervision of payment firms in with banks and complex investment firms, such as the category is called, is a really good idea. I think a unit that's dedicated towards the payment firm would really help, I think, the industry then to understand. Because people want to be regulated. Mm -hmm. People want to be compliant, right? Th that's the bottom line, that's, and I believe that to be innately true. But they need, they, need, they need you as a regulator to be more open, more engaged, and we need to know more about what you're thinking, I think, ultimately. Uh, that's, that's really powerful, I think, and, and, and really um, uh, some, some very important food for, for thought in that, which is indeed the purpose of yeah. this conference. But also uh, taking your point that you know, it's not only at conferences like this that one should be uh, sort of having these dis discussions. I think that's, that's really helpful. And I think it does fit not only with our sort of our strategic view on the value of engagement and the importance of it, um, but also, as, as I said at the beginning, with sort of as we now reflect on how we do better with particularly the startup technology yeah. firms. And I should how say, I, I yeah. should make the point that you've, the people within the central bank have always accommodated me, okay? <laughs> and, they've, and, and so, so that's, I have to say that because it's really important that, that like, I'm not saying that you don't, you do, sure. do you know what I mean? And, and oh, over the years, I have had numerous phone calls with numerous policy people, and I really appreciate that, you know, so that is a good thing. Th thanks, Colin. Um, Theo, any reactions on, on, on this sort of role of regulation and, and whether, any perspectives on, on, on whether, from what you've heard or in general, on, on the role of regulation in this space? 
Well, I think the, the engagement point that I think both of you mentioned uh, um, intensely, I think is critical. Mm -hmm. And from my experience, it's, it's not easy to bridge actually the gap. And you, mm -hmm. you also elucidated why that is. So it, it takes a conscious um, decision from, from, from industry. I mean, if industry can help, especially also these smaller firms to, to come closer to where the, the regulations are made uh, uh, is important. But at the same time, I think it also requires a, a conscious effort, a sufficiently intense effort on, on the part of regulators. Um, uh, otherwise, the bridge is not going to be uh, crossed. And actually, another consideration, um, particularly for the EBA, is um, if the banks sneeze, non-bank financial institutions will get a cold. So, um, <laughs> like, there are a number of issues that affect banks. Sorry, that affect non-bank financial institutions that are solely in the area of bank regulation. The biggest example is bank de-risking. Mm. Their lack of appetite to serve um, non-bank providers yeah. um, like ours. So um, we can't view any particular sector on its own. There's tremendous codependence mm. between all of the areas. So maybe a quick reaction yes, on that. Sure. I think yeah. we, we are very much aware of this, and we've been publishing several reports on that, and that it shouldn't be the end of the game or the, the result of the... Uh, I mean, the risking is a big topic from different perspectives, including from... An, I mean, we've seen that, I mean, after the, the great financial crisis, of course, but also in the context of AML risks uh, and also in the context of uh, different forms of, of innovation. And we, I think we've been, we are discussing it, and, and, and Jerry, you are discussing it also in your in the standing committee that you, that you, that you, that you chair. Maybe it's even more discuss, it's even, it's discussed even more in the context of our payment uh, systems, our services um, structure, but I think we are getting a lot of that. So maybe I mean, my message here also would be that you you should not underestimate what we hear also yeah, 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 from, yeah. from the ground. And I think you you collectively I would say manage to get your messages across uh, pretty clearly. <laughs> we, are, we are getting uh, letters. I'm getting uh, letters. I'm also invited uh, uh, to attend meetings myself. Uh, my teams are very much under pressure from yeah. a wide range of new players, uh, new types of. Firms. I think here there is a bit of a collection action, a collective action problem possibly. But it's true that those new entrants, they need also structures to, to, to get yeah. their voices heard. But that's not necessarily something that should come from the public sector itself. There are incubators, there are industry groups also. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a cost to servicing a large array of customers. And yeah. I think that should be also well understood. That's part of your business models, if I may say. And, and you should yeah. probably also be prepared to uh, pay for that uh, yeah. to some extent. That's part yeah. of, the, of the game. I mean, your yeah. technology allows you to serve or service a very large round of customers without borders, without limits, to some extent, regulation, OK, hits. Yeah. But uh, we, we, I think that that's, uh, again, uh, a big change compared to what we've seen in, in the past. That comes yeah. at a number of uh, new costs. And, and those costs also include the, the fact of being able to maintain a good awareness of how the regulation evolves and, and how, yeah. how you can best engage with, with regulators. But again, I mean, I would not be very negative in the, on, on the fact that we, we are not aware of what's going on. We hear uh, complaints from both sides, <laughs> the incumbents. <laughs> Banks are complaining like hell about PSD2 and, and, and so on. Uh, new entrants as well, which might also indicate that we are getting the, the balance right overall. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of issues I haven't mentioned. Okay. You know, like, like, okay. like I, gotta, I, I have I, a, a long list here. I, I'm going to move, I'm gonna move, I, I, I have, I'm gonna move yeah, us along yeah, yeah, because, yeah. because we're going to run short of time. And, and I do want to turn a little bit to it was an interesting discussion uh, between the last, uh, the fireside chat um, on crypto. There was sort of quite a bit of touching on crypto. And I, and I want to turn a little bit to that. Um, and uh, Laurie, I'll, co I'll come to you in a moment because I want to also get your views on regulation. But, but Theo, first of all, just, just let me start with you. Um, on your perspective on crypto, and I'm, I'm saying crypto, I'm not saying crypto assets or crypto coin or cryptocurrency, I'm just saying crypto. Um, is, it, is it the future or is it a phase? What, what, what's your perspective on, on, on crypto? Well, I, th I think no one will be able to tell the future of, of this particular development, but, but I do feel uh, pretty certain that there is a future for, uh, for crypto in, in the financial system. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating development. We see all kinds of things uh, on, on, the, on the cryptocurrencies. Uh, of course, there's already been a long time where, where activity has been uh, seen. Um, also, activity where, which I think uh, has proven itself not to have a, a good f uh, future. 
I mean, uh, the, the Bitcoin as a, as a phenomenon is, is fascinating, but to say that it's, that it's really a, a, a currency, I think, is, 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 is flawed. Even uh, value of Bitcoin, there is no fun fundamental there. At the same time, we have seen this huge development on stablecoins, and um, some, some will say they haven't got it really right yet, but probably they will get it right at some point in, in the future. And with right, I mean with, with fiat currency. Uh, fiat currency, in essence, is, is, is trust materialized. And I think that's also the, the, the ambition that, uh, that the, the digital currencies have as well. And, and probably they will get that right at some point. And at the same time, we see the, the central banks also uh, engaging with, uh, with digital currencies. Uh, um, and, and that's also a fascinating development because most likely they will, uh, they will get it right as well. Uh, to what extent and how, how big it, it will grow, nobody will know. But there is also some interesting opportunities there, also including, for example, for uh, social policies. I think uh, on the existing situation where we're at and where everyone is struggling with uh, handing out uh, energy price compensation, uh, there are interesting uh, 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 possibilities <coughs> in the future. Um, uh, asset, asset referenced uh, 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 tokens uh, are also uh, have the potential to, to increase the inclusion for example, for SMEs to, uh, uh, to capital. So there's, there's a lot of uh, interesting developments. At the same time, um, uh, to really harvest this, we must get the regulation right. And in that sense, I think Mika, uh, at the markets uh, in crypto assets uh, regulation, uh, I think to, to a large extent gets it right, would, I would say, I would argue. Why? Because, well, first of all, it's, it's a regulation and it's not a directive. I think that's critical. Uh, second of all, it's, it's consciously cast its net very wide, which I think is a very sensible thing to do to, uh, to actually build a, uh, a basis uh, for, uh, for the crypto developments. And it differentiates. So uh, uh, the utility uh, 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 tokens, as, as they are called, which, which are where the, the, um, the, the focus is not so much the financial function, mm. is, is, is part of that, but in a more lighter way. And only the essence there from a consumer is, is, is regulated. So there is liability, there is withdrawal rights, there is fair marketing requirements. I think, I think Mika sets a structure which provides clarity and is a first step. I think we should also recognize that as the first step, which probably also will, will stimulate and, and pre provide the structure for, for the industry to develop. And most likely, it will also be a benchmark uh, internationally. So I think, I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, development. Thanks to you. I mean, Laurie, I mean, I, I'm thinking back there to that exchange between Commissioner McGuinness and, and, and the Deputy Governors, and I, I think she said at one point, the Commissioner, um, and of course they're not an asset, um, in that context of, you know, do you call them crypto assets, do you call them cryptocurrency or what? And she said, they're not an asset. Um, and, and so the question is, uh, uh, I suppose to you, first of all, how powerful is the lasting use case, and, and what do you see it around, around crypto? Um, and then secondly, uh, w what is your view? W will Mika be a positive force in, in helping realize that use case or wh how are you thinking about Mika? Yeah, one quick point on the regulation piece yes. that we made, so, um, which we touched on there a second ago. Despite what people may think, um, the blockchain and crypto community actually welcome regulation. Why regulation brings standards and standards brings adoption. It's very difficult, and I think just to points that were previously made, it's very difficult to operate in markets which are opaque. Um, people will just risk off and not participate. It's just easier not to participate. So where there where there is regulation, that's actually a good thing. So if we look at the number of crypto users globally, there's about 300 million approximately. What will get that from 300 million to a billion is actually regulation, believe it or not. And that is contrary um, to the way people think. So um, I actually think Mika is a good thing. I know we'll come back to that in a second. In, in terms of if we look at, I guess, um, you know, where crypto is, yeah, so 300 million users. If we look at some of the companies who are looking at it, so from a financial services perspective, they're, they're looking at it from a, um, a picks and shovels perspective rather than necessarily investing in the speculation of it. So if we look at Goldman, if we look at BNY Mellon, if we look at SockGen, if we look at Morgan Stanley, these companies have invested 
billions into the underlying technology and infrastructure. Mm. Um, we saw recently, I think it was two or three weeks ago, KKR have tokenized one of their uh, health, their four billion health funds in order to provide um, a greater access to it in order to appeal to an, a broader investor base. So we're really beginning to see, I guess, applications within the financial services sector, which I think people thought that was a long time ago. Um, from an NFT perspective, um, and I feel like I'm, I'm playing a bit of um, lingo, bingo here, but um, basically from an NFT perspective, we're also seeing I guess companies provide loans. If you have a valuable NFT, you will be able to use that as collateral to get a loan. So the pace at which this is moving is, is actually, it is extremely, I guess, fast is the, uh, to what I was saying earlier. Um, I think why and, and some of the drivers behind this, why is fundamentally the Gen Z population, which uh, Commissioner McGinnis spoke about, they feel passionate about crypto. Why? They feel it is the internet of their generation. They, it is theirs. It is that kind of zeitgeist moment which they feel that they are part of that community, part of that movement. It's their thing. Um, they like the underlying blockchain technology which provides that transparency component. You're able to look at the transactions using block explorers such as Etherscan, uh, etc, etc. And then also you're able to trade 24-7. Um, you, want to, you want to wake up uh, on a Sunday morning, you want to start trading, you can start doing that as you wish. Um, and so this is still very early days. Um, the technology has been around for, for 13 years, um, but we are still, I guess, it's still relatively new. Um, and that has to be considered. So I think it's, it's funny, you know, when, when is blockchain going to be deemed um, to have hit mass adoption? I saw a great video recently of somebody walking into a McDonald's in Switzerland where they pay for their meal directly with Bitcoin. So not actually using Visa or MasterCard payment rails in the background. It was a genuine Bitcoin transaction which took place faster than a MasterCard or Visa transaction using the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Um, so like that for me is certainly the beginning of it. Here's another example locally, the Six Nations and the rugby competition which takes place here in, in Europe. Um, they, are, uh, and I, they are actively looking at NFTs as part of that. So we'll be engaging with NFTs during the next Six Nations competition. Um, so we're starting to see, I guess, what people thought would take years or never happen, happen. Mm. Thanks, that's a powerful article. Maybe uh, I do want to turn to the, o the audience. Um, Ruth, Colin, Francois Louis, anything on, on crypto that you want to? Thanks. Add, Ruth? <laughs> <laughs> well, on, on, on the topic of crypto, and I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be on the market advisory group on the digital euro with the ECB. And um, it was really interesting to hear Commissioner McGuinness's comments. It's interesting to see how quickly crypto is evolving um, and the European response to that. Um, you know, currently the work being done on a digital euro, as somebody who's kind of born and bred in payments, um, I still have a question in my mind over what value we're adding for the yeah. average consumer by using um, any of these tools as a method of transferring value. That's not to say they won't be successful, but we have to keep asking ourselves what specific problem are we solving with this new technology? And I think that conversation is going to keep evolving. Mm. Yeah, look, I think that's, uh, that, and that's uh, from the regulatory perspective, I mean, that's a really, I think, key thought, which is on the one hand, we, we always ask ourselves, so what is the, what are we, tr what's being tried to achieve, be achieved mm. by this product? Mm. On the other hand, this is really important, we've had this discussion, that as regulators, we remain very open, right? Uh, because otherwise you will say, well, we don't know that, we haven't recognized that, it's not something new, so let's, let's assume it's not, uh, so, so I think that, that balance, uh, is, is the real challenge uh, mm. for us. So how do we sort of allow the, the potential to flourish while making mm. sure that um, in the meantime the harms are mitigated? I want to go to the, to the, to the participants in the room. Question there. Yeah, please. Sorry, yeah. Uh, just there, there should be a mic um, somewhere coming. Yes, thank you. Mike. Dave, Dave Malone, uh, CEO of the Irish League of Credit Unions, um, just represent the credit union sector. I know there's been a lot of talk uh, today, I suppose, on this innovation piece, particularly around new incumbents or new, new, sorry, new entrants into the market. But I suppose I don't want to forget the incumbents either. For yeah. example, like the credit union sector itself, we've 20 billion of assets under our own auspices at the moment, our members. 
Um, that's, that's small compared to all the trillions we spoke about yesterday. However, I think what's really important to know is that 20 billion of assets is in the, in the communities. It's represented over 400 branches across the country. It's, in, you know, it's systemic for the communities themselves. And the credit union sector itself is beginning to really embrace technology and innovation. You know, we've significant presence now in current accounts. We're developing a very exciting, I think, mortgage solution as well. And I think just my question for the panel today, um, particularly thinking about regulation and public interest and trust, and I think as one of my colleagues mentioned yesterday, credit unions have won the Customer Experience Award for an unprecedented eight years in a row, so absolute great trust. But how, how as a regulator, I suppose, are you, are you going to ensure that there's a level playing field, not just for the new entrants, but also the incumbents, mm -hmm. particularly as the sector, the credit union sector now itself is developing very new, exciting products. And obviously, we want to have a level playing field, I suppose, to ensure that we can play our significant role as well. Thank you. Th thanks, David. Actually, I, mean, I might just I have a question from, from the floor, which I'll, I'll put to the panel. But let me just come back on that one, because I think that's a really, really important question. Um, and two aspects just, just, just to, to mention. I think one is um, in relation to, for example, all of the innovation-related activities, and, and sort of, again, picking up on the, on the point Colin made about the extent to which we're, we're, we're being successful or not, but it is very much the heart of that, that it is about incumbents and new entrants, because it, your, your competition, your innovation, your growth comes from both those sides. So that's absolutely uh, central. And then the second question, I mean, we've seen that play out very clearly now in the context, for example, of the department's, Department of Finance's retail banking review, where we have that question around, okay, you've got two of our large retail banks withdrawing, you have a, 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 a big ecosystem of remaining traditional retail banks, credit unions, and then uh, innovators, disruptors, payments firms, etc. How do we find solutions to making sure that basic services such as cash and other basic banking services are made available and remain available, but in a way that's fair in terms of uh, all who are involved in that ecosystem bear their appropriate uh, responsibility in that regard. I think these questions are very live mm. questions, so very much at, uh, to the heart of what we're thinking about at the moment. And, and uh, uh, so, so look, thank you, that's, that's, that's really important for us. I'm going to finish then with one um, question that has come in uh, through, through, the, um, uh, through the virtual participation channel, and that is, can innovation uh, create new opportunities to educate uh, consumers? And maybe, Theo, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you. If, 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 is, that a, is that a one that you've thought about? Is, is, is innovation going to help us in terms of consumer uh, education literacy? Well, I would say almost certainly yes. Uh, uh, but at the same time, I would also uh, uh, we should not think that it, again, is going to be the solution. It, is, it will certainly contribute in certain cer situations or for certain uh, groups of, uh, of consumers, but it will not be the answer to the uh, financial inclusion point that I, that I made earlier. Um, as also following on, on the point made earlier, uh, financial services are a public interest. It's, it's not obvious that market forces alone, especially not with all this major change that is ongoing, as by themselves will ensure the public interest is safeguarded. So that's why the financial inclusion question is so important, I think, uh, and also so important, especially also from the perspective of governments. They need to think to what extent, uh, beyond education, what other measures need to be taken to ensure that this public interest remains. Mm. Jay, Jay, can I just maybe yes. a quick thing? I mean, also on, on those, those two questions, by the way, I think, yes, indeed, we should use technology to change the way we um, help people understand the risks and, and the benefits of those products. We should not simply channel the existing documentation, I mean, in sort of paperwork, paper format into uh, those new channels and ask people to just call down and say, OK, yes, confirm that you read it. No, I think we should have things that allow simulation tools, that allow people to understand the consequences, help them play and simulate things instead. I mean, there are many ways of helping them to understand what they are doing, what they are buying, what they are investing in. So I think first, we, we've discussed that uh, profusely also at the Joint Consumer Day that we organize uh, with the ESMA and EUPA um, authorities. It's absolutely essential that we change the way uh, this documentation is shared and, and how people understand what they are, what they are doing uh, from a financial pers perspective. On your point about incumbents and, um, and, and, and new, new entrants, I think it's also very important that we come back to first principles. What is it that we call banking? 
what, what is indeed the, the core activity that in the first place um, asked for a regulation. I mean, and Diamond, Deep Vig, and all those, those guys who got the Nobel Prize, but I mean, what is making financial intermediation so important, so risky, that it requires a regulation? And that's the way we are trying to, to look at those activities now, both for the incumbents, but also for the, the newcomers. Uh, it's not like we sh there is no status quo. I mean, it's not because you've already received the license that you are off the hooks uh, and that the, 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 the work will continue as, uh, as usual. On the contrary, if you outsource big things, if you, if you enter into new technologies, that may change the mix of, of activities, the mix, uh, the, the organization you, you have, etc., and that, that may require new, new responses. Thank you. I'm going to, before they physically remove us from the stage, I'm going to <laughs> draw to a close. Uh, that, for me, has been fascinating. I would love to continue for another hour, it, at least. It, it, it has been really, really interesting. Uh, Theo, Laurie, Francois-Louis, Ruth, Colum, thank you very much. We really appreciate your, your time and, and your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, now we have, have um, reached the coffee break, and uh, please could you return by 11.45. Thank you.